please enjoy this experimental Cinema Verte short film of the Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe, as performed by Matthew Warner and filmed by Jay Haynes. She didn't know death so soon come back here that I would be dead. And I would have gotten away with it. the way she looked at me? Did you see the way she looked at me? She thought I was mad. She thought I was mad. But they have to understand there's a difference between a madman and myself because I am not mad. Madmen cannot be doing this. I'm doing this. I'm. I am taking us to the the station house. Other people hear things. Why? 
than ordinary men. That's my one, my one flaw. I did a charity. I did a charity to you and others ridding the world of that eye. See. It's just my my greatest fear right now is this I mean there's no doubt what what I did, but I I cannot I cannot go to the asylum. The lunatic asylum. See that? That's Western State Lunatic Asylum, right there. Dr. Joseph Dijarnet. Look. You see all this awful institution? They lobotomize people there. They lobotomize them. I cannot be lobotomized. I won't. So I have to make them see. They don't, they don't lobotomize the same people. They take them into custody, do they? Do you know? Of course you don't. Terrible. Terrible day. I do not deserve this! I would have gotten away with it! She would understand. But I hear that, I hear that in the, the gentleman's prison, they let you keep some amenities, yes? Like, um, bourbon? Cigars? Um, ladies of the night? Hmm? Maybe, and she would understand that too. She would understand that too. Men do not look dignified. I am not mad. I'm so nervous, I can hardly hold something. You don't think I'm mad, do you? Of course not. This whole town thinks I'm mad. You're nervous. Said. I'm not nervous. I am nervous. Yes, I, I am nervous. I'm always nervous. I'm not mad. Now they're looking at me. I see him looking at me. Don't look at me. I should. You know you can hear somebody looking at you. 
hear him looking at me. I hear his thoughts. It's not fair. They're listening to me. They're listening to me. Maybe they can hear too. That's one thing I have over them is I can hear better than them, huh? If there were a world record for being able to hear things, it would be me. See this place? It's the station house. Hopefully it will not be the end of my dignity. As you know, your, um, your deputies were at my, uh, my lodgings. Um, they, found, they found a body. Um, they wanted to take me uh, into custody immediately, but I can then send to release me on my own. Recognizance is a gentleman under the promise that I would come in this morning to turn myself into the auspices of the law. Uh, um, here's my information. You'll need it, no doubt. Um, to know is that madmen, I'm not mad. Madmen do not know they are mad. I know, you know, I know that I am not mad. And um, look, they, they can't send me to the lunatic asylum. That, that's, that's my main objective here. I, I will tell you everything, but I, they can't send me to the lunatic asylum. If they, a gentleman's prison, maybe. Do they have a gentleman's prison? You can send me to a metal gentleman's prison. and. Um, Brandy, just that's all I need. Just a brandy and a cigar a day. Maybe um, uh, a, a lady of the night once once a month, and I and I will be quiet and docile for the, for the, for the remainder of my days. I, I promise you. Do, do you think you could do that? Do you could make that me make me that promise, please? Thank you. I think so. <sighs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Okay. All right. I'm ready now. Tell me what I have to do.
they're ready to speak to the, the wax conifer. If I do the best I can. You seem very nervous, sir. You must be mad. <laughs> True. But nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous. I was and am. But why will you say that I'm mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed and not dulled them. Above all, it was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in heavens and in earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken, listen, observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It, it, it is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain. But once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. He, he had never wronged me. He never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes. But was it this? He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, it made my blood run cold. And so by degrees, but very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now, this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. You should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before it killed him. <laughs> and every night. About midnight, I turned the latch door and opened it, oh, so gently. <laughs> and then when I made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a, a dark lantern, all closed, closed, so that no light shone out. And I, I, I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, slowly, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon the bed. <laughs> what, a, what a madman! He's been so wise as this. <laughs> and then when my whole head was well within the room, I undid the lad lantern cautiously. Oh, oh, so cautiously. Cautiously. For the, for the hinges creaked. <laughs> I undid just so much that a, a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights. Every night, just at midnight, but I found the eye always closed. And so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every moment, every morning when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a, in a hearty tone. 
and inquiring how he passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night just at twelve, I looked in upon him as he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, my sagacity. I could, I could scarcely de contain my feelings of triumph. To think that even there I was, opening the door little by little, and he had not even to dream of my secret thoughts or the deeds. I barely chuckled at the idea. And perhaps he moved me, for, he heard me before he, he moved on the bed. Suddenly it startled. Now, you may think that I drew back. But no. <laughs> His room was black as pitch with the thick darkness, for, for the shutters were closed fashion for fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I, I, I kept pushing in on steadily, steadily. I had my head in, and I was about to open the lantern, and my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in bed, crying out, Who there? Who's there? <laughs> I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in bed, listening, just as I've done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan. I knew it was the groan of moral terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief. Oh no, it was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night just at midnight, when all the world slept, it is walled up in my own bosom, <laughs> deepening with this dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say, I knew it well. Uh, I knew what the old man felt and, and pitied him. Although I, I chuckled at heart. I knew that he'd been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He'd been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor. Or uh, it is merely a cricket made of a single made a single chirp. Yes. He has been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain. All in vain! Because death, approaching him, has stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head in the room. when I waited a long time, very patiently without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length, a single dim ray the thread of a spider shot out of the crevice and fell full upon the vulture eye. It was wide, wide open. 
and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness. It was all a dull blue with that hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow of my bones, but I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the eyes of my instinct precisely upon the damn spot. And now, have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the senses? Now, I say there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates a soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained. And kept still. Held the lantern, motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder. Every instant, the old man's terror must have been extreme. It, it grew louder, I say, louder with every moment. Do you mark me well? I, I told you that I am nervous, so I am. And now, at the dead hour of the night, and in the dreadful silence of that old house of strange noises, this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet, for some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. <laughs> but the beating grew louder. Louder! I thought the heart must burst. But now new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leapt into the room. <laughs> he shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. <laughs> but for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. <laughs> At length it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there for many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no longer. If you still think me mad, you will think no, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. <clears throat> the night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. <laughs> I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, <laughs> could detect anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out. <laughs> no stain of any kind, no blood spot, whatever. I've been too wary for that. The tub had caught all. <laughs> <sighs> When I made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight, and uh, as the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for I mean, what had I to fear? <clears throat> there were entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused and information had been lodged at the police office. And they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled.
for what had I to fear? I, I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man I mentioned was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and deposited them here to rest from their fatigues, while I, myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. <sighs> but ere long, I felt myself growing pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears, but still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued. It became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definitiveness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. <laughs> no doubt. I now grew very pale, but I talked fluently and with a heightened voice, and yet the sound increased. But what could I do? It was a, a low, dull, quick sound, which is a sound makes when a watch is enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, yet the noise steadily increased. I arose and drew and argued about trifles. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides of excited to fury by the observation of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, God. What can I do? I foamed. I raved. I swore. I swung the chair upon the floor in which I had been sitting and it grated upon the boards and the noise arose all over and continually increased. It grew louder and louder and louder. And still the men, they chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no. They heard, they suspected, they knew, <laughs> they were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think. Anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear these hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I would scream or die, and now, again, again, hark, louder, 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 villains, I shrieked, dissemble no more, I admit the deed, tear out the planks, here, here, it is the beating of his hideous heart!
Jay Haynes for the Film Sensei YouTube channel. I hope that you enjoyed this special Halloween experimental Cinema Verte presentation of The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe as performed by Matthew Warner. If you would like to hear The Telltale Heart only audio performance with special music added, it will be broadcast today. Sunday, October 31st, 2021 on WQSV 106.3 Radio here in beautiful Stanton, Virginia. The broadcast times will be 2 p.m., 5 p.m., and 10 p.m. Eastern Time. If you do not live in or near Stanton, Virginia, then you may tune into the live stream of the radio station at wqsv.org. Thanks for watching.